So hello and welcome. My name is Matt Corcoran. I'm the Additive Application Engineer with CAD Dimensions and welcome to our SAF lab. So today I'm going to be showcasing how we go from powder to parts with the Stratasys H350. And there's a lot of steps in between, but I'll break those all down for you. First, we're going to start with the powder, talk about the materials a little bit, get into the technology that powers this machine, SAF. Then I'll go over the workflow. I have a couple of cameras set up to show the printer and the powder retrieval unit. We'll talk about post-processing and finishing, and then we'll go over some different parts and applications. If you have questions at any time, there is a chat function, uh, so go ahead and throw those there. But if there's something I don't cover today that you wish I did or you had follow-up questions, feel free to shoot me an email and we can continue the conversation from there. I will also have some handouts going out throughout this that you can download and, and read at your own pace. So starting with materials. Right now, the H350 prints with Stratasys High Yield PA11. It's a nylon bioplastic material made from renewable castor oil. So it's, it has a um, good sustainability to it. it. Has high tensile strength, ductile and flexible, good impact and fatigue resistance as well, and a quality surface finish. The other material the printer uses is the half, the high absorption fluid. So that fluid is what's jetted onto the surface of the powder to enable fusion when irradiated by a fusing lamp so that the layers fuse together and you build your parts. And we'll get into that and go over that in just a second. So I, I did say right now this machine prints with PA11 and that's because Stratasys is currently developing PA12 and polypropylene. Those will be released for this machine within this year or next year. Um, so right now we're printing with PA11. They chose to start with that material because it's the most difficult to print with, with powder bed fusion. So right now I am going to drop in the data sheet for PA11, if you'd like to take a look at that. So SAF technology, SAF stands for Selective Absorption Fusion, and it's the branded term for powder bed fusion. How does it work? Let's go through the steps within the SAF technology process. So first, a layer of powder is deposited using a counter-rotating roller. Then an infrared lamp heats that powder to keep it at a consistent temperature. Then you have your second sled, there's two sleds, one for the powder, one for the fluid. The second sled passes over the bed and jets out that high absorbing fluid. If you're familiar with polyjet at all, it's a very similar process, um, except these are piezoelectric print heads. Uh, so the fluid is, is constantly moving through them, uh, which keeps them clean and, and, and keeps them running for a long time. So that powder is laid down, then the half fluid is jetted onto it, and then an infrared lamp fuses that powder wherever the half is located. And then that process repeats. So during the, when the sleds are going back into their home position, that allows a little bit of cooling so that the material can solidify and you can build your parts. So generally that, that's the process. Uh, these next few slides have a lot of information on it. I'll let you kind of read through. I won't uh, bore you with a monologue, but you can also reference this presentation later. So what are some key factors or some key points about SAF technology? First, the industrial piezo electric print heads it allows a high jetting frequency and the ability to eject multiple drops. You, so you can print in true grades, grade scale. And those print heads are recirculating the fluid constantly and they jet very close to the powder bed. So you can get high dot placement, which means very high accuracy, good details, etc. There's also inline cleaning. When the print sleds reach their rightmost um, position, which you'll see in a second, the, there is a, a vacuum there that will clean the nozzles and suck out any, any fluid that shouldn't be there. Um, so, those, so those nozzles stay clean at all times. And then the powder management, so the big wave powder management. So throughout the, during the build, the powder is um, fed into the print sled with an auger, and then any excess powder is caught sort of at the right side, which you'll see, and then that powder drops down and is recirculated back into the machine. So you can, this machine's very economical as far as material use. Um, 
which we'll talk about later, you can reclaim a lot of that powder and, and not, uh, not lose it to, to waste. So next production throughput. So powder bed fusion, one of the key benefits of it is you can stack parts within the build. You can nest them, which means you can produce a lot of parts. I'll have a demo in a second here. I'll show you, we can fit hundreds of, the, of small parts in, in the build at once. So the nesting density for this machine is generally 12%. Um, now what that means is 12% of the space of the build volume is occupied by parts. Now that may not seem like a lot, but compared to other powder bed fusion printers, this is sort of on the high side, but it's not, um, it's not the end all. You can, you can nest parts at much higher nesting densities, depending on the geometries. Um, so that's one, again, one of the main benefits where you get the throughput with this machine is nesting those parts in the build, which you'll see in GrabCab. And few consumables. The print heads in this machine are not a consumable. They're industrial grade, they're built to last. And if anything happens to them, they're replaced as part of the service contract. So lastly, end use production parts. Since this machine is uh, operates unidirectionally, linearly, the sleds are always moving in the same direction, that provides a lot of thermal consistency. One of the challenges with other powder bed fusion machines is one spot in the bottom left corner of the build could have a totally different thermal experience than a spot in the top right corner per se. But with this machine, they've eliminated that because the two sleds are moving in the same direction the entire time and that powder is heated and, and produces really consistent results. So next I wanna talk about some of the facility requirements for this machine. Um, it's not as simple as just plugging it in next to your desk and running it. We went through several renovations within this, this lab here to get it up to, up to spec. So first is the temperature control. Uh, you need to maintain between 68 and 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but more importantly is the humidity control. So that needs to be between 40 and 55%. And being in Syracuse, New York, the humidity can fluctuate throughout the year. So we have a just a standard humidifier that, that runs to maintain around 50% humidity. You'll also need three-phase power for both the H350 and the powder retrieval unit, and then fume extraction. So within the powder retrieval unit and the H350, you have to have a fume extraction, uh, air extraction connected to it. We use a Purex 800i, and that's so that powder doesn't accumulate within the within the printer that where it shouldn't and, and kind of suck all that powder out. Um, so we have ours sort of positioned behind this wall back here and connected to that is a cyclone dust separator and that collects any of the powder flowing through it um, so that you can re even reuse that powder as well. And then in addition to facility requirements, other PPE that's required for this machine uh, would be lab coats, gloves, and most importantly, a respirator. You don't wanna be breathing any of this powder in. Um, right now, as I'm in this room, I don't need to wear one because we're not printing, we're not depowdering or doing any of that. But while those operations are happening, you need to wear a respirator. So next I'm gonna jump over to GrabCAD print and show you what it looks like to prepare a build. We've talked about the powder and the material that's used and the SAF technology that powers this printer. So now let's get into the workflow and see what that looks like. So grab CAD print. So here's grab CAD print with the H350. I have a couple parts here, just a locator block and then a, a clip. And you have two kind of zones here. You have your preparation area where you can duplicate parts, uh, orient them, lock certain orientations, and then you have your 3D nest. So let's say I want to do 50 total of each of these. I would duplicate that. Duplicate that, highlight all the parts, move it to my nest. And here's where you can see the build volume. So then you get into sort of the nesting settings. And there's a few different methods. There's a standard, there's the advanced, we'll stick with the standard for now. And there's a few stop criteria. So it's, it's gonna try to fit all the parts based on the orientations you may have given it, or based on the nesting density the total height of the build or the time you want this to run. Um, if you didn't want to sit here for 
an hour waiting for this thing to nest, you can you can limit that time. Uh, but this thing, th this will nest in two seconds, as you'll see. So I'll, I'll lock the nesting de density at 12% and we will start nesting. So there it goes, placing all the parts within the build. And then the target nesting density has been met at 12%. You can see you have all your parts in there. Next, you'd want to validate the nest. And that was successful, no problems found. So as far as pre-print considerations go, um, there, there are some depending on what you're printing. For example, downward facing surfaces will generally have a, a better surface finish than upward facing surfaces or a more, more uniform surface finish at that. Um, when it comes to orienting holes or any uh, overhangs or bridges or that sort of thing, there's a few considerations there. But one of the best parts about this technology versus other 3D printing technologies is there essentially is no support. You don't have to deal with generating support material um, or configuring that because the, the parts are supported by any of the unfused powder, um, which is which makes it really easy to prepare these builds. So now that this build is is ready to go. I could hit print. It would send it to the printer and then uh, we would go from there. So now that we have that done, let's shift back and look at the workflow again. So we prepared our build in GrabCAD print. We've sent it to the printer and now we want to hit print. Like we said, anything with 3D printing starts with a 3D model. You can use materialized magics with this printer as well. Uh, but GrabCAD is the Stratasys solution. It's free, works great. Make sure you have your PPE on, you can start the print. Okay, so before I get into the slides about the workflow, I'm gonna talk about it and show you, show you a bit of the printer and then we'll go back and recap. So right now I'm gonna switch to this webcam that will showcase the printer. There it is. And I can stop sharing the screen so you can get the full view. So here is the H350. I'm going to unlock the lid and open it up. On top here, which you can't quite see, is a bunch of ceramic heating coils to keep the temperature consistent throughout the build. Again, that's one of the most important things about powder bed fusion is having a consistent thermal profile across the entire build, the height of the build across every part. Then you see here we have the two sleds. This sled is the uh, powder distribution with a counter rotating roller. It would lay that powder down onto the bed. And then this sled over here is for the fluid. And that's what jets the fluid. It has those piezoelectric print heads. And then underneath this sled are a few, uh, this is the vacuums to, to clean the heads as it's printed. Right here is where you load in the powder, loads in through this. And if you, if you do get one of these printers, you'll notice a lot of the parts are printed on this machine because um, that's a, a great application we'll talk about is industrial equipment. So to load the powder, we have this trolley. And with the trolley, there is another attachment that the powder, uh, powder container can go on. And then you roll the trolley up to it. It tilts the powder container. There's an adapter here. And then it feeds it into the machine. What we have here is the build box, which I'll talk about in just a second once we get to that point. Now, this machine, as far as powder consumption goes or powder ratios, it prints in a uh, 70 to 30 mix. So that's 70% used powder and 30% virgin powder. Uh, so that, that means you, you can reclaim a lot of this powder. You'll get, you'll get consistent results uh, regardless, and it makes this machine really economical. Uh, underneath this screen here, which you won't be able to see though, is where the fluid goes. Um, so if you're familiar with PolyJet, the fluid cartridges almost look ex exactly the same. So there's two spots. One cartridge has the fluid in it. The other cartridge is for waste. Okay, 
right, so next I'm going to close the lid and run the sled demo. The two sleds are going to go back and forth, and you'll see how the lamp turns on to, to fuse the layers. I'm going to grab that webcam and get a little bit closer. Uh, there might be a glare, but you should be able to see kind of what it looks like. So you can see kind of right there where the light is. I'm going to see if I can get this a little bit closer. So there's only processes happening when the sleds are moving from left to right. When they go back to the left position, there's nothing happening. And a lot of people say, well, why don't you have it printing in both directions? It'll be faster. Well, because of thermal control and thermal stability. So they move back into the left position. The right sled would jet the powder, or the fluid, excuse me, jet the fluid, and then fuse it with the lamp that's turning on, and then a new layer of powder would get placed over the bed. Okay. So let's say... We just printed something and our print is done. Now it's time to take it off the printer. I'm going to cancel this operation, home the sleds. So once the print is complete, there is a, a cleaning procedure. You want to um, make sure you clean up any of the powder. Clean machine is always a happy machine. For that, you'll need a anti-static vacuum. We have a, a Nilfisk Nil ATIX uh, 3. Um, and so you would open the lid. And then the build removal box comes into play. So when the build is done, these parts are, are warm. They're, they're quite hot. So once the final layer of powder has been laid, the machine cools internally for about an hour, and then the print is complete and you can remove the build. You take the build removal box, Position it up. Drop it down onto the rails, and then you would slide the box over the bed. The bed would then raise the cake up into the box. Pull it back. And now your cake is ready for cooling. So for cooling times for this machine, it's generally it's twice as long as the print time. So the print time for a full height build is 12 hours. So the cooling for that would be 24 hours. You don't have to print a full height build every time. You could do half a build, a half height, say six hours. So then that would need to cool for 12 hours. Um, and that's to ensure none of the parts are damaged when you go into the depowdering process. Because uh, if they're warm, you could risk breaking them, they could warp, they could bend. Um, so cooling is very important. So once we had our cake, cake removed, we would then clean down the machine, and it would be ready to, for, for another build. For the cleaning process, you take your vacuum, vacuum up all the powder. You'll want to inspect um, the, the vortex belt up here. Make sure the powder is removed from that. And then inside, inside here are sled protection strips, which will, over time, collect residue from slightly fused powder. So those will have to be removed and cleaned. Um, again, can't stress enough, clean machine is a happy machine. So then, then we're ready for depowdering, and that's where the powder retrieval station comes in. So I'm going to switch the camera to that and show you what it looks like to get your hands in there. Okay, so here you're looking at the inside of the powder retrieval unit. This is made by Farsoon Technologies. So once you have, once your cake is cooled, you would put the entire cake into this unit and then start breaking it apart. 
So it has these gloves for you to use. There's also an air compressor attachment up here, and that's really good for blowing off any of the powder. But essentially all you're doing is, is breaking it up. You see here we have a few parts that have some powder left on them. This is a foam stand. And then all of that, all of that unfused powder will go down into here where there is a sifter that will sift the parts. And you might be able to tell one of the parts fell down, that'll happen sometimes, but it all will stay within this crate here. So really quick, I will turn this on so you can see it agitating. So that's shaking the, the sieve so that all the powder will fall down. And that will fall down to underneath the machine where you have another powder container and you can reuse that powder. Uh, again, with a 70, 30, 70% 70 used powder, 30% fresh powder. So that's a powder retrieval unit. And next I'm going to go back to the slides, kind of recap what I just said, and then talk about post-processing and finishing. Okay, so we've sent our job to the printer, our parts have, built, have been built, and now we take those parts off, use the build removal box and the trolley, move it onto a shelf, let it cool for 24 hours if it's a full height build, or twice as long as the print time. Then, like you just saw, we take that cake into our powder retrieval unit, where we break it apart, all the powder will fall down and collect into a powder container to be reused. Um, and you can put that back in the printer. Then that leads us into finishing, uh, which is probably one of the most important parts of the whole process. So once you take the parts out of the powder retrieval unit, they will still have a little bit of powder on the surface, and, and that's where the post-processing comes in. There's a lot of options for post-processing SAF parts, and it's very application dependent. Uh, it depends on what you need the part to do, how you need the part to look, you may not need much finishing at all. But the bare minimum, once they're out of the powder retrieval unit, is a bead blaster. And that will clean the parts, take off any of that excess powder, and then you'll be left with parts such as this. In addition to bead blasting, there's you, you can tumble these parts, sand them, drill them, uh, vapor smooth. You can dye them to any color. Uh, you can get them to look however you'd like. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit more about post-processing. So at CAD Dimensions, we've partnered with Dimension to offer their finishing systems. Uh, they're, a, they're a leader in, in added manufacturing post-processing solutions. Uh, we have a piece of their equipment right behind me here, and I'll kind of break down what they have to offer and how it plays into to the parts. So first would be the PowerShot C. That's your, your bare minimum cleaning. C stands for cleaning. Um, that, that would be taking the parts, throwing it into this drum. It's an automatic bead blaster. You can also manually bead blast these parts. However, you'll, you could run into issues with uh, burning the parts, as it's called, where you, you held the nozzle a little bit too long. Uh, so that's why we went with the automatic bead blaster. It gets a very consistent, uh, very clean finish on the parts, gets all of that powder off. Then from Dimension, you also have the PowerShot S, S standing for surfacing. And it's very similar to the PowerShot C, but it's just another level of surface finishing. It'll smooth out any of the bumps and create a more homogeneous surface and get your parts looking real nice. Then let's say you don't want a gray part or a black part, you want it to be blue. Dimension has the DM60. Uh, they're able to Pantone match colors. So virtually any color you want. And that's what this uh, in the bottom left there, that is the, the DM60. It's a bath with dye, the parts go in, runs for a couple hours, and then the parts come out in whatever color you choose. And then the, my favorite process from Dimension is the Power Fuse S. So this is vapor smoothing. Um, it uses a, 
uh, eco-friendly chemical to sort of almost melt the, the top layer of the part and it'll smooth it out. And, and these parts look like injection molded parts. You can't even tell they're printed after you use a, a power fuse S. So Dimension offers that whole workflow. Uh, once you have your parts out of the power retrieval, you can use any of these systems to get, to get the parts looking how you want them to look. Because some of these components might be used internally. For example, this connector clip, uh, electrical wires run through it and it clips together. Now, I can't imagine the color of this part is very important or having a extremely smooth surface finish is that important. So for that, you might be fine with just using a power shot C, cleaning them up, and then they'll work. But if you wanted something in a different color, say black, you can then dye the parts. This is a, um, a housing for a drill. So that's post-processing in a nutshell. Again, it's very application dependent. So if you're thinking about using this technology for, for some of your components, uh, we can have that conversation of how should they be finished? Can I get away with just a clean gray part or do I need it smooth? Do I need it dyed blue? Whatever it may be. So next I'll go over some, some of the target applications uh, for this machine. And this is pretty broad, but with 3D printing, you know, the, you, there's almost no limitation to what you can print. That, that's kind of the best part about it. So first is like some commercial goods, uh, goods for the commercial industry, different tooling as well. Uh, this picture here is an end of arm tool. Uh, though you, can, you can do that, other tooling for your shops as well. You also have transportation. That part is a um, of, uh, air vent, like in an airplane to control the airflow. So parts like that, like I showed you before, this is an automotive clip. And I have another slide on this one in a second. Also consumer goods, um, different game controllers, um, computer mice, uh, any consumer good. In fact, I, I should have brought it in here. I have a set of golf clubs that has a powder bed fusion part on the backing. Um, it's dyed black and, and made a lot of sense for that application. So getting into those electrical clips, this is a great example of just the, the throughput of this machine. So one build for these electrical clips can create 192 pairs of parts, and that's a 23% nesting density. We talked before how 12% is generally the standard, but depending on the parts and, and the geometry, you can go higher. So this one, they were able to nest uh, at a 23% nesting density for 384 parts. And that broke down to approximately 475 per pair based on 11 builds a week. So running this machine constantly. This machine does like to run. Um, it's always, it, it's best to, to use it as often as possible. So that's why we like to have that conversation of how you'll be using this machine to make sure that it, it does make sense and it's getting the throughput you need. However, doesn't mean you can't let it sit. Our, generally, we've been running this about once a week just to keep the lines going, the powder agitated and, and um, keep the machine clean. So in the, in the bottom here on the bottom left, you're seeing a part that has uh, been cleaned with a power shot, C, then dyed black, and then vapor smooth. So you can see the vapor smooth creates a, a really, really nice finish. Next, I like this uh, picture because it kind of showcases the differences between other technologies. So on the left, you have an F900, which is an FDM system from Stratasys one of the largest they offer, and they use those, those clips uh, to run an analysis. So on the F900, they were able to fit 176 parts in a single build. And on the H350, they were able to fit 198. So you may say, well, hey, that's not that, that's not that many more parts. You know, what's the, what's the difference? Well, that would be the time to part, the print time. So with 176 of these clips on an F900, that is over 15 days of printing. On the H350, that's one 12 hour build. 24 hour cool, finishing and you're done. So within 36 hours, you can have 198 of these components. And quite honestly, they will be better than FDM components. Um, so that's just to showcase kind of the, the difference between the machines.
So just to recap what makes this machine great, what are some of the key things to take away? Industrial grade technology. This is not a printer that you buy for your house. This is a printer you buy for your lab, for your facility. It's a workhorse. Process control. By having one of these machines in-house, you have complete control over your process. Components that you normally may have needed to outsource and buy elsewhere, you can just print them yourselves. And guess what? On Monday, you can print these. On Wednesday, you can print these. On Friday, etc. So you can use it for whatever parts you need. You can put different parts within a build. I could do one of these and one of these in the same build. Doesn't matter. So having that control over your process is huge. And then throughput. We talked about nesting and how many parts you can really fit inside. In addition to that is the automatic post-processing from Dimension and the PowerShot C and PowerShot S. You can take all 200 parts, throw them in there. They'll all, they'll all get cleaned evenly, which means you'll have consistent, accurate quality parts. And that leads us to end use production parts. For a long time, 3D printing was never thought, we never thought 3D printing could be used in end use products, components going into assemblies, into final products, whether that's industrial equipment, automotive, commercial goods, uh, et cetera. So now, now we can. With this machine and with the post-processing you can do to these parts, they, they are strong, they are functional, and they look great. So I'm gonna look at the chat here, see if we have any questions. I'm also gonna push a couple more handouts. First is the general product bro brochure for the H350. Um, that has a lot of good information on it about the machine, a lot of the things I talked about today. I'm also gonna share with you this automotive um, applications infographic. It shows you all the different parts they printed for cars. Um, Stratasys has actually partnered with NASCAR to, to print parts using this machine for those, for those cars. And then I also like this infographic, which is industrial machinery, and it shows you all of the parts on the H350 that were printed on the H350. Um, so that's really cool to see. And lastly is a nice white, pa white paper that shows you how consistent and accurate these parts can get. Um, with, with production, a production process needs to be reliable, repeatable, economical, sustainable, and this H350 hits all those points. So that, that might've been a lot. We went over kind of the workflow starting from powder to final parts. Um, I have a couple other parts I'll kind of showcase here uh, while we see if any questions come in. Here's that clip we saw. So living hinges are a possibility, works great. Um, we also have this, this fan duct cover so, you know, for your, for your car, for, for whatever, you can, you can print quite thin and the material's strong. Here's another um, duct cover for a car. And this part, which I showed before, is a seat lever for a car. And then this one's really cool because it's a spring. So you can see this material has really good flexibility to it and ductility. So that's everything I have for you today. Um, if there's something I didn't cover that you wanted to, wanted to talk more about, feel free to send me an email. My email's down there um, and we can continue that conversation. I really enjoy having those conversations with our customers talking about what they're doing now, why isn't it working and, and seeing if the H350 is a good fit because in a lot of cases, it is. So just looking at the chat, doesn't look like any questions have come through. Um, if you're looking for any other documentation other than the handouts I share with you today, again, shoot me an email. Um, there's a lot of information out about this machine. So if there's any remaining questions you have, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. So other than that, I hope you enjoyed kind of this live look from the lab. Of, of how this machine works and the workflow involved. And uh, if, you, if you're ever in the area, stop by, we'll, we'll show, you, show it to you in person. Uh, you, know, you can see it for yourself. So thanks everyone for joining and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.